Hello, welcome to uh, perhaps one of the last uh, weeks of Citizens Forum, if Shaw has their way. Um, it's Wednesday, April the 11th. I'd like to start by thanking the volunteer crew and Shaw staff that always make this show happen. Um, so we told you on the last show that we would report back about uh, what Walter was told a few weeks ago, which was that we're, the show is going to be put on a hiatus. So you and I both wrote Shaw asking why and how long, and I didn't get an answer back. Did you? Well, I did have a conversation. Conversation, but nothing in writing that, that no. I got, at least. Uh, and we were just asked, wondering about how long this might occur and, and uh, some of the ins and outs around it. And there's no definite answers yet. So we're just kind of on a holding pattern to see uh, what's going to happen. But we know that we're going to be taking some time off, at least. Well, is it we're going to be taking some time off or we're going to be kicked off? Well. I mean, the way the way it's said, because I don't want to be taking any time off. Yeah. Do you want to be taking any time off? No, I want to continue the show. I yeah. think it's you know it's so important that we stay on the air. So we we're going to see. I mean, of course, uh, we're we're taking steps to in everything that we're legally allowed to do to uh, to ensure that we stay on the air. And there are there's a mandate that the Shaw has to meet and. And uh, there are regulations that the CRTC have developed. As pathetic as the CRTC <laughs> more, is. As, as dense as they are and ah. as hard to understand as they are. But it does appear that uh, we have a good case that, uh, to present that we should stay on the air. Yeah, we have a good case to present, but the judge, jury, and executioner <laughs> <laughs> are not working. Uh, you know, they're not, uh, shall we say, uh, neutral. Uh -huh. So. The reason all this is happening is that over the last few years, the industry, which is Bell, Roger, Shaw, Quebec Corps in uh, Quebec, and a few others who own all the cable stuff, they made a deal first with uh, Stephen Harper and then with Justin Trudeau. And the deal was community television, the budget, the money would be removed. And the money would be given instead to the licensees, who are Shaw, Rogers, Bell, and the others and that was to subsidize their local uh, TV news. Because, you know, times are tough, they don't have money. They don't have money, so they're taking this uh, community TV budget giving it to them. So they don't have money, but I just saw this in the Globe and Mail. It's, uh, it was written February 20th of this year, I think. It's talking about the Shaw Pension Plan for the people at the top, the, the top people. So, started in 2002, it racked up $378 million in benefits for 15 executives in just 10 years. So, once again, $378 million in benefits for 15 executives in just 10 years. Before it was closed in 2012 to new participants, so nobody else could get in. While no new Shaw executives have joined the plan, those active employees still in it continue to accrue benefits, and Shaw estimated the total obligation to all the plan members would be $518 million by the end of 2017. So, I mean, here's a corporation saying we don't have enough money to fund our local news, so you've got to close the community TV, and, and, and this is where the money's going. So there's something very wrong here. Yeah, well, they don't have any money, Jack. They, they had to give it to their employees here. Yeah, uh, we're, we're thinking that there's a lot of misplaced uh, priorities uh, in, in Shaw if, if, uh, if the, the meager amount of money that it costs to, to keep this show going, and, you know, it's uh, mostly uh, volunteers, uh, there's a few staff in Shaw, and they're wonderful, wonderful staff here in Victoria, and they supported us all these years. Um, but, you know, these are salaries that, that they're making a living, and they, they, they hear that. And it's so disheartening to they hear that, that, the, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, are being given away to a few top executives. You know, it's pretty disheartening, and it's, I think it's unfair. 
So we'll report back uh, next show as to what we've learned about the hiatus. Next. On the well, I, I, I did a little bit of uh, research. What is it? You go online, you go on Google, and you try to figure out What's who are on? these players that in, in politics these days. And, you know, I, what I found was, uh, you know, Enron. Remember Enron, good old Enron that, that uh, imploded uh, about 15 years ago, and it was a big scandal. And Enron was, for those who don't know, one of the most corrupt things that ever happened in the United States, and that's saying a lot. Enron was at the heart of it. Well, uh, the, we had two, two different connections here. One was uh, Richard uh, Kinder, who is, the, of course, the, now the president of Kinder Morgan. Okay. He was at one time the president of Enron. No. Believe it or not, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, many bad things were said about about Enron. But also, you know, if you uh, see the URL that's coming up, uh, read that article, and you see that uh, mainstream media has been saying some pretty nasty things about Kinder Morgan and how, particularly, how they have skimped on maintaining their pipelines to save money. I've never. I don't see that in the media. Well, it's there. You and, really, and must you, really have to read look. the article. What I'm seeing in the media is Kinder Morgan just wants to build a pipeline to yeah. help people with jobs. So there you and have that. And then, then on the other side, we have the Site C Dam and 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 the decisions made around that by Accenture, who took over the administration of BC Hydro back in the Gordon Campbell days. Well, Accenture uh, morphed was morphed out of. Uh, the Enron scandal also because the, the bookkeeping giant that was actually the brains behind the Enron scam was Arthur Anderson and Associates. They, a lot of them were, there was criminal charges laid against them and they were found guilty. But anyway, um, a firm sprang out of that called Accenture with, that soon after came to British Columbia and took over BC Hydro. And that- When you say took over BC Hydro, what does that mean? Well, the BC Hydro, uh, the the liberals of the day, uh, Hydro is uh, separated in different divisions. And they took over say. one division. They they took over the administration of oh BC Hydro. Oh my goodness, the administration. The people that make. We gave the administration of BC Hydro to Enron. Well, sort of. That uh, you know, it's, you're going to people will feel bad of the the people that work for Accenture, but you now that's where they did come from, and they you know <laughs> Enron had did the tricky double bookkeeping that, that everybody found out about. And if you look at the way Accenture is doing their bookkeeping with BC Hydro, it does look quite strange how they can defer expenses and claim that the, that the, uh, the corporation is worth a lot more than what it actually is. Let's just go back to, to, to the Kinder Morgan for a minute. You said that the Kinder of Kinder Morgan yeah. was once the president of, That's right. of Enron? That's right. He was CEO well, or president. What do you want to call him? But uh, but Enron, the whole the whole Enron thing was a scam, right? And he was the president. He was the is president. Is it possible? <laughs> is it just possible that the whole Kinder Morgan thing is a scam? Well, we're going to get into that a little bit about okay. the politics around that. But just of interest, people should read these articles. Try to unravel this, folks. Try to unravel it. I don't know what it is. I'm just looking at this and thinking this is strange. These, these characters are showing up here and these major, major things that are happening in British Columbia. And, uh, you know, the connections are a little more than a coincidence, I think. God help us, that's all I can say. So. It is unbelievable. I mean, the kinder of Kinder Morgan was the president of Enron. Yeah. Well, wait till the media hears about that. I'm sure oh. it'll be front page, from, you know, all <laughs> over CFAX. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, enough of that. Next. Well, the other thing, of course, is connection was, uh, with uh, Elizabeth May getting arrested uh, at, over in uh, Burning Me Mountain, opposing the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion and all that. And the topic of the day was uh, a judge expressed a view that, that she should be up for criminal contempt. Now, this is not just a civil matter. Now, the, the Crown could take over and actually charge her for criminal contempt. So. Here is another story where, uh, you know, we're talking about Elizabeth May here. She's, you know, one of the finest Canadians we have, and she's taken a principal stand 
Uh, she, I think she's taken the correct stand here. By the way, Jack, the, you hear in the news right now how the federal government has made a decision based upon national interest to have this pipeline and all that. And the, um, the what's the group, the National Energy Board, where three energy oil executives have sat down and decided to, to ignore thousands and thousands of submissions pointing out how fundamentally and morally wrong this is, how it, it's a, a destruction, of the vi destruction of the environment and the, you know, ignoring Aboriginal rights and, uh, and the, the issues all around greenhouse Murdering gases. Murdering the future. They're killing the future. No, it's, just, it's just fundamentally wrong. And now, uh, but uh, this is what Trudeau's holding up to us, and so is Rachel Notley, uh, that uh, this has all been just was a fair process. Well, we know it wasn't a fair process. So for them to hold that up in the media now. You know, it's interesting because John Horgan never says it wasn't a fair process, come to think of it. You know, that's a good argument that he could yeah. make, and it's true. Well, we know it's, 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 it's rotten to the core. If you looked at the, how, what happened there, and it's just, so we're, here we have uh, uh, Elizabeth May, a very principled person, uh, doing the right thing as far as I'm concerned. Uh, perhaps others would agree, like John last week uh, didn't, wouldn't agree, perhaps. Yeah. But I think sometimes, um, you, you know, uh, you do have to take a stand. Laws and regulations and all that, you, you got to cast them aside because this is really the wrong way to go. And I think now that we have uh, uh, Kinder Morgan now making the announcement that they're not going to be investing now until this all gets sorted out, uh, has uh, uh, shown, I think, that primarily the people that really do have the moral authority is the First Nations people who are really the main actors in this opposition. And then we should follow their example. Uh, I think the, the, the other players, that's including the British Columbia government, you know, of course, Alberta and the federal government, you know, these are three, three and different the media. governments and the media because they play the role of outlining the story. Yeah. And I think they're giving us a story that is, I mean, the, on CFAX they had a phone-in thing. Yeah. Should Elizabeth May go to jail or something like that, cr be criminally charged? And I'm thinking, yeah, that's the way you at CFAX want to phrase it, but really the owners of CFAX should be going to jail yeah. because they have led us into disaster after disaster after disaster, pretending to be our friends. The media always pretends to well, be our they friends. Well, can, they can give their opinion. I don't think they should go to jail for having the opinion. But it's not. For, it's, <laughs> it's for controlling the news and controlling the story. They have us fighting each other. That's right? true. That, they, the, the media are causing a, they're talking now about pulling Canada apart. For what? For an oil company? But the thing is, it's okay. They're a media outlet. We know how that all goes. I mean, I, I couldn't agree that they should go to jail. But you know who should be Criminally penalized? charged. Criminally charged. <laughs> then let's see what a ju judge and jury decides. But the Kinder Morgan uh, company, uh, and if you look at their history, and if you look at the history of their spills, now there you might have a case where these uh, this environmental destruction could be seen as being deliberate, particularly when major news organizations have said that they have been scrimping on their maintenance and, and making profits on not taking care of their pipelines. Now that's negligence. Now we, have, we do have something to work on. So, uh, but anyway, it all ties together, Jack. I mean, we're struggling, uh, the public is struggling to tr figure out what is really going on. And uh, we have all these players, all of whom have it, oil industry executives right by their sides. And Walt, we're going to have to leave it at that. Exactly. But think so. of it. They all have oil executive, oil industry executives. They're in the in-group. We, the people of BC and Canada, are in the out-group. So let's change it. Thank you very much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back to Citizens Forum. And uh, I have with us today Will Smith. Will's our editor and director here on the show. And Will's always coming in with uh, 
creative ideas and, and different perspectives on different things that are happening in our society. Now, we just celebrated Easter and, uh, and of course, that's, uh, Easter's all about the resurrection of Christ and, and, uh, and the whole story of the whole Christian story. So, Will's come in and he's going to talk to us a little bit more about the concepts of, uh, of resurrection. Welcome to the, to the show, Will. Thanks for having me. It's always a, always fun to be here. So, so uh, the first thing I wanted to, uh, I've had a chance to think about this for a couple of weeks because I've actually got a new job. I'm doing some dubbing for a Russian film company. And uh, the, the, uh, one of the topics that we're doing things on is resurrection. And the, and the Orthodox Church has resurrection a week later than our, the Western Church. So they celebrated last Sunday. And I was trying to come up with a definition for resurrection. And um, I decided that resurrection, the, in, in the terms that I want to talk about it here, means that, that we change our viewpoint to where we understand at a very a visceral, at a, at a body level, not just in our brain, but we understand that consciousness is primary. And so what that means is that our consciousness is really the only thing that exists and our material world is a function, simply a function or a product of consciousness. Now that's a radical change, but that's what our scientific, our science from the 20th century says. Quantum physics, the dual split experiment, all these different things say that everything that is around us is a function of our consciousness. So uh, the easiest way to get an idea of that, in my opinion, is uh, to listen to people who, are, who have had near-death experiences because they have experienced that conscious, they've, they've come back to life, they've been dead, and then they've come back to life, but they've, without exception, they all, something has so seriously wrong with them that they died and it gets fixed. So in fact, that's what you're saying, that these people are resurrected. They're resurrected, right. Okay. So. So uh, what we see is that we can see that we can, we can watch these experiences and some of the people who are, have been through a near-death experience are people who know about how the mind works, how the brain works. And uh, so I've, I've watched about uh, four of them recently that I wanted to talk about. And I wanted to first put it into perspective. I've got a, a chart here. I'll just hold it up, to, but I'll put it on a better way. But there, there are different ways of resurrection. There, there are involuntary resurrections, and then there are voluntary ones. So in the involuntary department, we have near-death experiences. We have UFO abduction. There are lots of people who have been abducted by UFOs, and they come back. We have uh, what's called a kundalini activation, which typically just destroys people's lives. I mean, they have to pay attention to whatever it is that's happening in their body. And then some people have out-of-body experiences, and they, they may not be dead, but they get knocked out of their body. I met one fellow, for example, who had been arrested, and it freaked him out so badly that he, got, he, popped, he told me he popped out of his body, and he was watching the scene, but he, he passed out, and he was watching himself get arrested. Then there's a, a voluntary resurrection, which are, comes from, say, ayahuasca or LSD or something like that, mushrooms. Uh, astral travel, there's a guy named Robert Monroe who has a lot of books out, and he worked for the U.S. government doing astral travel and gaining military intelligence. And uh, then there's meditation or contemplative practices. There's a flotation tank, that's an extension of that. There's martial arts and Tai Chi. We're gonna have a guest talking about Tai Chi. And that's a very, that's the same type of thing. It's, it's getting to know that you're not your body and circulating energy in your body. And then there's also lucid dreaming or dream uh, yoga. So um, I'll put up some, some URLs as, I'm, as we're talking here about different people that uh, you can put up the the uh, first one, and uh, that's uh, that's a fellow named uh, Ptolemy Tompkins, and he worked with Ibn Alexander, who is a neuroscientist who had a a seven day death. He was he was brain dead for seven days, and then he came back. And this fellow Ptolemy helped him write his book. So I just he said the first thing he said to himself was, "Think in your head, Ptolemy. What is this book, Proof of Heaven, about? You may have heard of that book. It was a yeah. bestseller." He said, okay, this is my, what I came up with. 
A wounded healer undergoes a perilous journey out of our world and into another world. It takes seven days. During his departure, he's guarded by his sisters, who together with his son and wife, succeed in drawing him back to earth. This hero, this initiatic being, encounters an angelic being who is female, but whose characteristics transcend all limitations of earthly relationships. She is more than just a person, and yet she is a person. During his absence, there's a kind of supper held by the chief females in this person's life. It's a kind of last supper for this fellow who is gone, although he is not there. He is the main character. So even though this is, you know, life imitating art. Mm -hmm. Then this guy returns miraculously. His eyes pop open and he's resurrected. And he comes back with this message to bring to the world that it's absolutely necessary for us to get this message. If Joseph Campbell were alive, he'd jump out of his socks if he met this surgeon. It's preposterous. Even story is a myth come to life. It's a myth for our time. A myth not in the sense of a story that's not true, but a myth in the sense of a story that is so true it transforms and aids in the transition from one mode of thinking and way of being to another one. So even is too good to be true in a lot of ways. Now if you think about what he's saying there, he's saying that this is something that we all need to get. And, and once we get this, we're going to well, look what at the is, world a different way. What is the central idea, though? Well, I mean... Uh, well, the uh, idea is, okay, I made it up, I yeah. modified our chart, and I'll just hold it up again and put it up on the yeah. edit, but um, the idea is that we have an old civilization w that we know the rules, and this old civilization thinks that the world is flat. The old civilization thinks the world exists, and, and we're just transients. Yeah. And then there's, a, there's a, a new discovery, though, that the world is round. Okay, there's a new discovery that consciousness is primary, and death is just it's fake because yeah. these guys are up there in this in this uh, different place wherever it is their brains are non-functional in this case even alexander his entire neocortex had been eaten away uh, by bacterial meningitis he said when his colleagues knew what happened to him and when he when they saw him again after he came back they they would just they would be astonished shocked because you don't come back from that you do, there's a 1% chance of coming back to life and a 0% chance of recovery, and yet here he is walking around and he's better than he was. I'll throw a, I'll throw a question at you or an so idea. Go right ahead. So, like, um, so as you say, like within, in, our, in our world that we're living in right now, that most of us live in, we have a concept that, of separateness. You're a separate being and I'm a separate being. Right. And um, are you saying that in truth, uh, in, in, in what's really happening in the universe, that there's no separation, that we're all part of this universal consciousness, let's say. That's right. And, and the thing is, the thing that we're all experiencing right now is we're, we're experiencing the death of our old civilization. We have all these medical problems that can't be solved. We have Fukushima that can't. We have all these problems that can't be solved in our, in their, our current way of thinking. Well, resurrection is not a, an event. It's a process. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that these people, there are lots of people who are going through resurrection right now on the planet, and there have been in the past, but there are more now. And they're seeing, they, they, they cannot look at the world the same way. And so they're doing things to create this new civilization. If you watch even Alexander, he was the, uh, let's see, he's the, the uh, second URL that I put up. And he's, you can't, you couldn't take this away, you couldn't, try to prove to this guy that what he experienced was not real because he's a scientist he's a doctor he experienced this himself you can't take that away from this person so he's busy yeah he sees himself as being quintessential and to get his message out to people and so this is really going to change the world we live in it doesn't yeah. matter whether you can see it or not from where you sit or where <laughs> i sit because we maybe we haven't experienced resurrection ourselves but again, it's a process. Some people go through a near-death experience, but you may have friends or you may be experiencing it yourself. You're looking at the world and it, it, it looks different to you. Yeah, and, and you know, in, in, in just straightforward terms, I mean, in any idea that you might have, uh, when, it, when, the, when, the ide when you are processing a concept and you find a refinement to that concept, there's a death to the old concept. Right. And in that process, 
of, of, of uh, getting into the new paradigm, there's that resurrection. And, yeah. and, 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 and from there, there might be many other times when that idea will be refined and you will leave it behind and move into another level of, of consciousness, let's say. Yeah, and I, I'm in contact with a lot of different people who are working on resurrection. I mean, I'm in contact with these Russian people, but I also have a, a friend uh, who's originally from the United States, but now he lives in Italy. He's a, he's a Catholic, Roman Catholic priest, but he's an expert on Buddhism. And I think I've talked about him on the show before, but yeah. he hasn't actually witnessed this happening. But, but what he thinks is that this is kind of a hundredth monkey thing. Yeah. And so not everybody has to get it in the same way or at the same time, but we're all going to go through this. So, so here we are in, in our old civilization and we're, you know, we're worried because all this stuff looks like we're destroying the planet, we're doing all this stuff, but it's going to be okay because there are people who can look at it in a different way and who can see that consciousness is primary and we're going to get a way out of this because how can you bring people back from the dead? Well, we don't know that in our old way of thinking. We think that's crazy. It doesn't, it sounds like you know, I mean, it's just not, a, it's not a, it's a fairy tale. It's not a real story, but it's yeah. true. It's happening. And the question yeah. is, what does that look like for all of us? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's something to really think about. I mean, uh, I have known people that have near death experience and, and they will more or less express the similar sort of things about what happened. Yes. And including, uh, not necessarily wanting to come back that they basically thought that this is a better deal and they're going to move on. Right. And there's another one. Uh, this is the third one. And the, this woman's name is Natalie Sudman. And she had, an, she had a near-death experience in Iraq. Her car was blown up. Mm -hmm. And she spent a long time getting, as she puts it, uh, she, was, she was just getting uh, like a dump. Uh, and she was just telling everything yeah. in front of a lot of people. And then she went back with two people and saw her dead body and sort of decided what was what they were what how it would be helpful for her what would what would be okay to fix and what wouldn't be okay to fix and so she said you know it's kind of funny when you're at this at this level where you can do anything with the wave of a hand and so she says we'd wave my hand and and i'd have brain damage oh that'd be funny now let's see how i'm going to live my life with brain damage or you know <coughs> excuse me they just they decided to do uh just not to do very much to her. Yeah. But her story is very convincing, very intelligent person. But you can see that once, once you've seen your dead body and then you see somebody wave their hand and you're okay, you can't look at the world the same way. When you're into <laughs> that kind of a thing, a lot of uh, other, you just realize what's important and what's not important, exactly. you know? And, uh, the whole, all those concepts that you had lived with your whole life are falling away now. And the most important things perhaps are that idea that we're all joined, that we are all part of a universal energy, and that, uh, that we're, you know, that our goal should be more to live in harmony with the universe. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, the right people get this idea while we're alive maybe some oil industry executives and some politicians might do well to have but this experience. But you see, experience. they're just going to be sort of left behind here yeah. because they can't get it. I mean, the, yeah. the people, there are loads of people who are getting it. And the thing is, they're not, they're not necessarily saying anything. This one, another doctor, Mary Neal, she's on the, the fourth one that I put up. She's a surgeon. And she waited for a few years before she told her story. Yeah. Anyway, I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about this. Um, great. It's great food for thought. Well, always so interesting to talk to you about these ideas. And we should be dwelling more on these ideas, I think, as, as we're trying to wonder, well, what are we doing in this world? And, and what are the most important things that we should be taking care of? So that wraps up this segment of Citizens Forum. As we draw closer to the referendum on electoral reform, lots of Canadians still have questions about what the future of their voting will look like. Hello, I'm Jay Kerrigan, and I'm here with my co-host today, Eleanor Vanham. We're going to talk about voting education. Today, with us, we have a very special guest, Daniel Reeves. Nice to be here. Great to have you here. So, Daniel, 
you've got a history of working as a senior political aide, and you're currently a professor at Camosun College. So welcome. It's great to have you on board today. Great to be here. All right. Now, Dan, our first question is, um, you've had a lot of positions in the field of politics. What was it about teaching that really drew you in? Well, um, you know, it was just a natural passion. I uh, spent a lot of time knocking on doors, working on campaigns, uh, working in government, and uh, the other half of my life I'd spent doing a variety of teaching jobs. And one day we moved to Victoria and there was an opening and I realized that was it. That was the combination of, of the teaching that I'd done previously in sports and other things and this passion in politics. Okay, all right. So it was a professor for political science. You do a lot of work on political theory. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about the theory of proportional representation that you think could be beneficial for British Columbians? Well, I think ultimately, I think there's a feeling among some people uh, that in some ways our democracy is failing us. Okay. How so? Well, I think ultimately democracy, when it's effective and when it works, people feel that sense of legitimacy. That while they may not agree with who wins, the system that produces the winner is fair, is right, feels right, is right, seems fair. And I think right now our system was built 150 years ago. And at the time, the spirit of democracy wasn't near as strong. And not only, of course, did people, not near as many people have the right to vote, but just the sensibility about what democracy would mean to the society. It's 150 years later, and it might be time for a refresh. Right. Well, we've seen over history there's been evolutions in the way that we vote. Women, people of color. These are evolutions. Do you think that maybe proportional representation is something akin to that, where we're expanding the scope or the quality of our democracy? You know, there's no perfect system. Uh, proportional representation in its various uh, ways and methods exists in numerous states around the world. But I think here in Canada, there is tends to have been falling voter rates, uh, rates and just a, a, a higher level of 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 dissent about what our democracy is pr producing. You certainly see that in the states as well. Um, I think the opportunity to look seriously at our system and to ask the questions and see and investigate. I mean, as a political scientist, this is what we do. But to extend that question to the broader base, to the audience of British Columbia, I, I, to me, that's a really important process, whatever the results. Right. Now, a lot of people say that proportional systems are more complex to understand. When you're teaching, do you find it's harder to teach proportional models than it is to teach the first past the post model? I, I don't, at first blush, yes. There are some parts of some types of proportional representation that can be a little bit more complicated. C complicated at first blush, but not complex. Um, I think when we start investigating the results of each type of system, whether it's first past the post or mixed member plurality or two vote ba two ballot runoff system, when you look at them, even for a few minutes, you start to look and say, oh yeah, okay, I, I could do this. I think the first test for voters is, could you make a reasonable choice? And I think with a little bit of work, a little bit of time, I think voters could easily learn up. I think the reward of learning up would be better democracy. And I, I guess as a political science, uh, I have a natural incl inclination to say that's a worthwhile investment. Yeah. And it's certainly something, I mean, not all of your students are political science majors. So you can probably teach the public if you can teach people taking the course as an elective. Certainly. Um, you know, we, we really try for, for people who most of our students aren't political science majors. Um, the important part there is just giving them a sense of ownership of, for their citizenship. Mm -hmm. And honestly, if we've had a system in place for 150 years and people know it, if we adopt a new system, I don't think it's going to take 150 years for them to new, know this new one. No, definitely. So you talked about your students, and not just poli sci students, but other students. Um, do you notice there's a change, you know, from the way that they perceive the systems when they first hear about it to after they've studied it for maybe just a week or a few weeks? Yeah, I'll, for my classes that study and look into it, we usually actually have a debate at the end of the semester. One of the things I try to focus on for all the groups 
is to see the nuance in each system. Mm -hmm. There are levels of things. There are certain strengths to each system. There are certain weaknesses to each system. It's important that students come to understand that there is no perfect system, but what choices you make and how you express your political will through voting um, has an impact on the wider society, whether it's the voting levels, whether it's that sense of this is a fair system and I feel like this democracy is legitimate. These are the kinds of values that you need to understand. That to me is the ultimate sort of gift of citizenship is mm -hmm. to look critically at these systems and understand them with enough, enough depth to see both their strengths and their weaknesses. Definitely. Now, um, in terms of people looking to educate themselves more, figure out how to understand our systems, is there something the general population can do? Well, you know, we offer great courses at political science at Wilson. <laughs> so, um, look, uh, there's, of course, a million sources online, and I would recommend going, starting with the nonpartisan ones. So Election BC, Elections Canada. Um, the state of Oregon actually has a really great, uh, because they've asked a lot of the same questions we're asking now, they have a, a, variety, a series that is, again, it's not partisan, it's not backed by one side or another, that explains systems. Look, there's tons of information out there. It's, it's finding the ones that don't have an, uh, an immediate and obvious bias. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's probably the best way to get the real facts. Or, or take a class. <laughs> or take a class. Well, that's always a good idea. Right. So what would you suggest to people? Because obviously they can go out of their way and look at these sources on their own research. But people get bombarded by a lot of media, some of it for, some of it against. And sometimes it can be hard for these people to pick out what the real facts are versus what is, you know, a little bit pushed by one side or another for their own reasons. So. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for these people who are trying to discern the facts from the fiction? Well, I, I think part of it is try to go to those sources that don't have a dog in the fight. Mm -hmm. So be cautious and careful of sources and, 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 and information that's coming to you either directly or indirectly from whatever side. I, 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 that doesn't mean, by the way, that those sides are the, the information is necessarily wrong. It's just important to start with a critical eye. Um, try to go to those sources that don't have a dog in the fight. Oh, definitely. Well, you need to be able to recognize the bias that everyone has. Right. Whether it's a poli like a politician in particular, or a party, or an organization, right. you need to be able to see and think critically about why right. is it that they are against or for this. Yeah, and there are, you know, there are interests lining up for and against in the province that do have a vested interest in, in one system or the other. Uh, our current system has produced uh, basically, by and large, uh, one dominant party in British Columbia for, I mean, if it wasn't the Socrates, it's been the Liberals. So we, we've had opposition and the NDP has been in power for here and there, but maybe that's not enough anymore. It, it was produced stable government, which going back to that, you know, origins of our democracy, stable government was the most important thing. But perhaps today, there's more interest in coalition governments. I think those, those sources that have a vested interest, that vested interest is long, I, to sort of go to the second level of your question. If people put their interests on the table and say, this is where we stand, mm -hmm. I think that's fair. They can then say, look, we have an interest in X, and therefore, we want Y. Mm -hmm. OK, fine. I'm always a little more dubious of they come off as if they're objective or as if they have no interest, and yet, subtly, behind the scenes, there they are. So an informed decision is the best decision. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Dan, for coming, and thank you, Citizens Forum, for having us again. It was a pleasure to be here, and hopefully we'll see you all again. Welcome back. Uh, it's still Wednesday, April the 11th. I'd like to again thank the Shaw staff and our volunteer crew that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. Um, my guest in this segment is Scott Lambert, and we're going to be talking about something that I think is wonderful, Tai Chi. And 
we were just talking about health and Tai Chi and you wanted to talk about positive change one breath at a time. Absolutely. It's uh, great to be here. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, you know, I've had uh, the experience of uh, losing my health. So uh, once you lose your health, uh, you find that there's nothing more important in life. Uh, you spend all of your time trying to find a way to regain it. And uh, for me, uh, in my experience, I tried uh, doctors of every uh, shape and form uh, and nothing seemed to be able to help me. And uh, it was actually Tai Chi Tren that uh, brought my health back to me. So kind of like not something you would normally expect to hear? Uh, you know... Were you surprised at the time? Uh, I had no idea. I was really floundering. Uh, maybe I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, my uh, experience. I was involved in a, a serious motor vehicle accident uh, in which I had the classic near-death experience. Um, I left uh, my body, left the earth, uh, went out to a barrier. I had no recollection of uh, my life on earth. Uh, I felt very good, very positive. I felt I was going to a wonderful place, uh, excited to go there. Uh, just as I reached that barrier, I uh, felt something trying to get my attention uh, from uh, this sort of quadrant. Uh, I, I didn't want to pay attention to it. I wanted to go uh, into the light, as it were. Uh, but I did break my concentration from going there just for a moment to see what was going on. And uh, that brought me uh, back to earth, back to my body. I woke up on the pavement uh, so uh, confused that I thought I was flying over the Appalachian Mountains. It turned out my face was on the pavement <laughs> and I was looking at the, the rocks silly. of the bitumen. <laughs> so uh, that happened to uh, be during a doctor's strike. Uh, I wor woke up in the hospital. Uh, I, the doctor asked my name. I opened my mouth. I drew breath. I wanted to tell him, but I had absolutely nothing. Uh, so... I was like a baby, but a baby with a very broken body. Uh, my experience uh, with the doctor strike, uh, I w ended up going to massage therapists, a very painful uh, experience. But uh, after everything, long story short, I uh, woke up one day, uh, decided that uh, things on this side of the world were not flowing in my direction so that I must go to the other side of the world. I sold everything I had, bought a one-way ticket to Hong Kong actually and uh, headed off to try to uh, make a change and, uh, and find a way to get my health back. So at that point in time your health was still not good? Uh, more than not good. Uh, I from uh, I was about 25 years old at the time, and I described uh, my life as uh, being uh, at a very advanced age. To get out of bed uh, was a long ritual, uh, rolling on my side, hanging my legs over, uh, using my arm to prop me up. Uh, very, very weak. Uh, I was always afraid that uh, I would be in some situation that I wouldn't be able to get myself out of uh, because I was so weak. So at that point in time, you left North America and flew to Hong Kong. Uh, that's, uh, you know, a, a circuitous route. Uh, I stopped in Japan. I had met someone. Uh, I was in university at the time that uh, my uh, accident happened. I uh, stopped off in Japan to visit them, thinking I'd be able to live there. Uh, it was uh, difficult. I was meeting uh, resistance, uh, getting a job, uh, that kind of thing. 
uh, a fellow came uh, and met me who had, uh, he was studying Buddhism. So in that study, he had gone to uh, many Southeast Asian countries. He spoke Chinese, Japanese, uh, Hindi. Uh, he read Sanskrit. And uh, after a few minutes of uh, meeting me, he said, you really need to go to Taiwan. Uh, it's a very uh, welcoming place. Uh, you'll be able to get a job there teaching English. And uh, on the strength of that, I uh, had my ticket to go on through to Hong Kong and then uh, bought a ticket to Taiwan and uh, went to Taiwan not knowing anyone and uh, started off there. And you came in to somehow into starting to do Tai Chi. Uh, what happened was uh, everywhere I went, no matter where I went, I uh, did my best to find doctors, healers who might be able to help me. Uh, I went through a lot of uh, very individual and interesting uh, treatments, and uh, some of them would hap help me for a short time, uh, but always my symptoms would come back. I would uh, be in the same place I started, and I realized I would either have to spend the rest of my life uh, going through these treatments, or I would uh, have to continue to search. Uh, about the same time, I uh, met uh, the most wonderful woman in the world, uh, my wife, uh, May, uh, and uh, we uh, uh, were both very unhealthy. I had uh, been uh, running a wellness center uh, at a, a different time in the uh, Gulf of Thailand where uh, a person told me about Tai Chi. So when I returned to Taipei, I was uh, talking uh, with May, and she happened to uh, have a, a child student whose father was the uh, longest studying student of a famous Tai Chi master. So uh, we found a way to get invited uh, to uh, a, a get-together uh, so we could uh, experience what was going on there. And uh, that's how it, uh, uh, we ended up uh, meeting our, uh, our Taiji Tran master. So uh, at this point, I would uh, actually like to uh, dispel a couple of uh, misunderstandings that uh, uh, pervade in the West about Tai Chi. Uh, most people think when they, they hear the term Tai Chi that the Chi part of Tai Chi is the chi that we hear about uh, our life energy that uh, people you know uh, work their chi uh, there's another uh, 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 method that uh, some people have heard of chi gong and uh, they associate that same chi with tai chi but uh, actually there is nothing in chinese culture called tai chi it's actually Tai Chi Tren, which translate as Grand Ultimate Boxing. So Tai Chi Tren is actually a, a martial art form that has a combat uh, self-defense aspect to it. The uh, great thing about uh, Tai Chi Tren is the initial benefit of Tai Chi Tren is your health, your strength. So by uh, studying with uh, our master. Uh, in the beginning, it was uh, very tiring. You wouldn't think that something that looks so calm and smooth and, uh, and uh, meditative would be something that really works out your body, but uh, in actuality, it uh, really is uh, a workout for your body, your mind, and your spirit. And yes? Now you were somebody who was in poor health at the time when you began. How did it feel to be doing Tai Chi with, uh, uh, I mean, was it painful? Uh, you know, it was uh, draining. It was really taxing. Okay. And, uh, you know, my wife and I remember when we would walk home because uh, we started feeling uh, benefit almost immediately. And 
uh, so much so that we uh, put everything else aside in our lives because uh, it was just like uh, someone in a desert who got a drink of water. We just uh, wanted to uh, be close to our master all the time, to uh, study with him, to practice Tai Chi Chen, to do it well, uh, to understand it as, as much as possible. And uh, when we were walking home, we'd, we'd go to the park. The, the entry level uh, part of Tai Chi Chen is you study in public in the park with uh, your master, follow along with his movements. And uh, after uh, doing that for an hour in the morning, walking home was uh, everything that we could do. Uh, I remember a, an especially tall curb that we would have to climb, <laughs> and our legs were just screaming. Uh, that you, you would never imagine that, but the more we did it, the better we felt, the stronger we got. And uh, just by, uh, as I call it, doing this little dance behind our master, uh, after about three months, the uh, problems that I had, the tremendous pain, the difficulty getting out of bed, the lack of strength uh, melted away. And so I became a complete believer. Uh, at that time, our master asked if we wanted to become disciples, which is uh, uh, going through a ceremony. Uh, there's a large... Uh, uh, monetary buy-in that uh, shows that you are earnest and uh, allows the master to, uh, you know, do this as his life uh, work. Uh, so uh, in the beginning, I didn't think that that would be something I wanted to do. I'd already seen the benefits. I thought that would require a, a monk-like existence uh, on my part. Uh, I, I told that to the Tai Chi family and the master, and they broke out laughing at my uh, misunderstanding. Uh, tai Chi Tren is uh, another way that you can uh, increase your energy, just like breathing, just like eating, and uh, through that, you are able to engage in life more. So uh, it's been a fantastic thing for me and something that... Uh, I feel that everyone can benefit from, so I want to encourage uh, everyone, if you have an opportunity, to uh, find a way to uh, learn more about Tai Chi Tren, and uh, if you have the opportunity to study. You wanted to talk about, we've only got a minute left, you wanted to talk a little bit about takeaways, and maybe you just did a bit, but anyways. Uh, you know, uh, my takeaways, uh, there are fundamental uh, aspects of Tai Chi Tren that everyone can use in their life. The uh, number one uh, takeaway for uh, people is a word in Chinese called Song, which is uh, often translated as relaxed. But uh, we want to uh, relax in a way that's an, an energetic relaxation where you let go of your tension, but you, you don't become just a lump, as it were. You feel this uh, give and take between uh, a light feeling, but at the same way rooted. And uh, in that uh, symbol that we know of as the yin-yang symbol, that symbol is actually called Taiji, it's from Taiji trend. So just in that way that the light and the dark balance each other and there's that tension of the, the spot of light in the darkness and the spot of dark in the lightness, that's the, that energetic uh, relaxation that I'm talking about where you uh, let go of your tension but at the same time uh, you uh, engage in everything around you. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jack. I think if we all did more Tai Chi, this would be a better country.